Um, good evening. I'm Peggy O'Neill, the Adult Services Programming Librarian at Penfield Public Library. And I'm delighted tonight to present Miranda Stefano to do a program on Stop Fake News, Responsible Sharing on Social Media. Miranda has um, done various programs for um, many libraries. She's a district librarian at Hillside Children's Center. She's an RIT graduate uh, in new media uh, publishing, and um, she's a disseminator of information. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Miranda. So. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, I actually just as of last week, switched jobs and I'm actually oh, now okay. <laughs> I know I forgot to update my bio um, sure. I I now work in um, the city school district um, in school number oh, okay. 17 so um, just starting a fresh new job this year which should be exciting um, with all of our COVID craziness um, so I'll, I'll give you guys um, you know a little uh, introduction to me but you know we heard all, a little bit about me already um, but I what I really want to talk about is so you guys um, I have this little meme that I put up at the beginning of all of my presentations, um, and it's facetious, you know, it's a joke. Um, I actually do like to be interrupted while I'm presenting uh, topics, especially topics like this. I feel like if I can hear from you guys and what you want to know about the topic, because I could teach a whole semester long class on this, um, and we only have an hour tonight. So, um, if you guys speak up and ask questions um, about what's important to you, I can tailor, tailor it to fit you know, your needs. Um, but before we get going, um, either through the chat or unmuting yourselves, you know, is there something specific that you guys would like to hear about tonight? Just so I, right off the bat and kind of understand what you want. And again, you can use the chat if you don't want to talk out loud. Um, or you can just shout it out. So I'll give you guys like maybe 10, 15 seconds to think about um, what you might wanna hear tonight and then um, I'll dive right in. And I think we were going till 8.30 if um, people want to, that's what I booked it for. Oh, so if that, when you said, you know, if you said an hour, but I did extend, or it was till 8.30, so. Perfect. That is good because otherwise I talk too fast. <laughs> Just check in the chat oh, here. Okay, great. So you guys are a nice blank slate. Um, I'll, I'll give you guys what I have. Um, but if I spark an interest or a question along the way, please do interrupt um, and jump right in because it's always more fun if we have a little interactive um, aspect to what we're doing tonight. Okay, so um, I got interested in information literacy and, you know, telling truth from fiction online, you know, as a librarian, but what really focused that interest with the, this organization called the News Literacy Project and their free software that they made for students called Checkology. When the pandemic started, they actually made Checkology free for more than just students. Anyone who is interested in it can now use it. So if this is a topic that you really want to continue practicing and, and learning, make sure you check out their organization and their tool, Checkology. A lot of what I've taken from them is in this presentation tonight. Okay. So today, the sort of three learning outcomes for us, things that I want us to walk away with. Um, the first is understand what misinformation is. We all have a basic definition of it, but what does it really, what does it mean deeply? And then identify some tools and use some tools to help in the identification of that misinformation. We're gonna know what it is and we're gonna have some tools to identify it where it's not so obvious. And then finally, I hope to inspire you guys to continue learning and continue practicing your own information literacy skills. Uh, it's not something that we actively taught in schools with that label until very recently. So it's something that I think a lot of us could use a lot of practice with. So um, I already talked to you guys a little bit about, you know, what you guys want to know tonight. 
Um, I'm just gonna make this a little bigger. Um, and so some of my animations can work a little better too. So again, um, sorry, might take a second to load back up. Okay. So we're gonna talk about classic fake news. Now, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions out and if you guys have an answer, shout it out, put it in the chat. Um, but what is classic fake news? What pops in your mind when you hear fake news? Old school fake news. So this is what pops into my mind is the tabloids, you know, fat boy, you know, mermaid skeletons found, um, you know, stuff that you would find in the newsstands at a grocery store. Um, and this was pretty easy to identify, you know, unless you were a young child or very gullible, you kind of knew that it wasn't true. Um, but, you know, fake news has taken a you know, big turn and it's really changed a lot in the last, you know, decade or so. So it takes a little bit more work to identify. So speaking about the term fake news, you know, labels do matter and what we call things help us understand them better. So I want to challenge ourselves into better understanding what term fake news actually means. So there's three different labels I think we should understand. The first is misinformation. And that is when we have information that's not true, either purposeful or not. You can make a mistake, right? You can post something and just be inaccurate. That's still misinformation. It doesn't matter if you did it on purpose or not. But then you have disinformation. And that is when someone purposely is telling you false information. It doesn't have to be with a bad intent. You can sometimes tell people things that are not true as a joke, as satire, but it's purposely done. You know that it's wrong. You're not making a mistake. And then finally, we have mal information. You know, that prefix mal meaning bad. This is information that is purposely wrong and purposely meant to cause harm. So we sort of have this continuum of misinformation um, and fake news. Sometimes it's just a mistake. Sometimes it's not. And then sometimes it's actually done with the purpose of creating harm. Any questions um, before I move on to the next one? Okay, I'm gonna try to go through the first part of the presentation kind of fast so we can get to the actual practice of, of looking things up. So I'll, I'll move along. So we might think misinformation is a product of our modern society. And you know, back in the good old days, everything was great, honky dory, but it's not true. Misinformation dates back hundreds, thousands of years. Um, I took some of these facts um, from commonsensemedia.org as an example. Um, the New York Sun in 1835 ran a report um, that animals uh, were living on the moon. And they published this in their newspaper. And it was done with the purpose of increasing their circulation making more money. And it worked. It went from 8,000 circulation to 19,000 circulation. So there's an example, you know, 200 years ago ish, where people were publishing misinformation with the purpose of gaining more money. Another example is Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. Um, you know, this was done as a show as entertainment. But if people tuned in two minutes too late and didn't hear the preview of this being a play, some people might have understood that this broadcast um, was not a play and thought it was a real news broadcast saying that aliens were attacking the world. And that was in 1938. So there's a lot of examples like that uh, misinformation happening in the past. Now, there is a great book um, by Cindy Otis called um, True or False, a CIA Analyst's Guide to Spotting Fake News. 
And she has a whole, I think it's even the whole first half of the book is dedicated to the history of misinformation. And she goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptian times. And it's fascinating to see how people use misinformation to manipulate the world um, to be what they wanted it to be. Uh, so if you're interested in this topic and learning more about the history of misinformation, um, this book by Cindy Otis is a really good, good choice. It was written for middle school students in mind, but it's, you know, it's, it's for anybody, anyone that's interested in the subject. Okay, so let's take a deep dive here and really get into the nitty gritty about misinformation and the different types of misinformation um, as they go beyond the misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. There are actually different categories that go out this way too. So the first thing we wanna talk about when we talk about categories of misinformation is the, the motivation of it, why, why people do it. Um, I mentioned money before, but there are some other motivations that people have to create um, misinformation. So first, money. And that, that one's pretty obvious. Um, people wanna have more money, so they manipulate people to give them their money. So usually examples of this are scammers, you know, people who send you fake information, trying to get money from you. Um, it can also be companies, you know, companies aren't always honest with their marketing and what they're telling you about their product. So I have an example here. Um, this is an example of a scammer um, trying to get money. They would, you would find this in your email inbox and it says Netflix payment declined. And it says, you know, we're attempting to charge your monthly fee and your credit card's not going through. Please send us your number with the code on the back so we can charge you know, you being in the middle of a season of The Office or something like that, and you need to get through the rest of it, you might panic a little bit and just send them the information. But this is specifically uh, created to get your credit card information, not to upgrade your Netflix, but to probably go buy the person who sent in a new pair of shoes or something. So the next, um, motivation is group and like you know your group your um your political group your country your state you know whatever group you're part of it's something that you are going to try to you know take your group mm -hmm. of people and and lift them up um governments political candidates uh, partisans you know they're trying their group is trying to gain advantage over other people an example of this um is this video was posted past. Oh, oh you do I this? I think someone who is well, I unmuted um, might just want to mute themselves because I think I hear a little background conversation. Um, okay, perfect. I think it's someone who called it on the phone. So if you guys want to mute yourselves, um, that would be awesome. I I might be able to do it for you too. Let me just speak. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. So this was created back in November during the election, and it was a video on Facebook, and it showed a man in a suit going up to a ballot box and putting in a whole bunch of ballots, just like stuffing them in. And it, you know, the caption read, you know, look what's going on in Michigan. This is crazy. Uh, we can't trust the election. Now, the group interest they were serving was to seed mistrust in the election because whoever posted this said that they didn't like the outcome of the election. They wanted to make that mistrust in it. Now, if you use some of the skills that we'll learn later in the presentation is you'll find out that this is actually a video from 2018 in Russia. So there's no way it could be connected to the current election that just happened because it's not the right time, not the right country. Um, but it was created to put that mistrust in the system. So the next one is um, malicious motivation. And I don't, some of you guys might've heard the term trolls. 
Um, a troll is someone online who just likes to make a mess and make people angry and just watch everything happen afterwards. Um, so there also can be extremists, you know, people who like to create chaos because they feel like they can gain an advantage in that chaos. Um, and they, these are the really dangerous ones, especially now, you know, that we're dealing with all this information about um, COVID and how best to protect ourselves. You know, people can be really malicious and sharing information that can actually be quite harmful. So this is an example of malicious motivation. Um, it's a post from Twitter and it says, I was at the Black Panther premiere, but a group of black youths said this movie wasn't for me, I'm white. They then proceeded to assault me. I'm headed to the ER now. So this is malicious because it is trying to create anger and fear among people. So, you know, if you can imagine someone going to a movie theater and then someone beating them up, being like, this isn't for you, you know, all that racial tension and causing that chaos of people being upset and angry and very emotional. Now, Again, if you use some of the skills that we're going to talk about later, um, you can do a backward search on this image and you'll see that this image is actually from Flickr from, I think, about five years before the movie of Black Panther came out. So this picture is not evidence of someone's bloodied nose or bloodied face. It is a picture they stole from the internet and made a false narrative around it. Now, that's not to say that someone didn't get beaten up at a movie theater. That's entirely possible, but this picture used as evidence is not cutting it. It's not evidence because it's not from the time the movie came out. So there's a brighter side to this too. Sometimes people make mistakes and they share misinformation because of an accident. And we call this altruistic. You know, you're, you're spreading misinformation. You might not know it's misinformation, but you really think you're trying to help people. Um, this happened very early on in the pandemic. Um, people were saying, take your, your mask, put it in a Ziploc bag, microwave it for two minutes, and then you can use it again. It will be sanitized. Of course, many masks contain metal nose pieces and this, or pieces of plastic. And this was causing a lot of fires. And there were some fire departments that actually put out um, PSAs saying, please don't do this because you're causing fires and giving us extra work. So not all misinformation is evil trolls, you know, just trying to make the world a chaotic place. Sometimes people just don't know what they're doing. And so that's why you guys are here is to hopefully learn how to recognize this misinformation and not be one of these altruistic people just trying to help out and spreading misinformation. So now that we've talked about the motivations, we're gonna talk about some types. But before I do that, I'm gonna take a little sip of water and see if anyone has any questions before I move on. Okay, you guys are a quiet bunch today. That's okay. <laughs> I have plenty to say but please don't, don't be afraid to interrupt. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the different types of misinformation. We have satire or parody. I mentioned that earlier, and that's when we make false information just for humor. Here's a picture, um, again, early on in the pandemic of some dolphins in the Venice Canal. Now it turns out this was not the Venice Canal. It was a canal, but in some other country. Um, and someone made it just to be funny. Someone took it a step further and made this post, um, which shows some Lisa Frank artwork and says, oh, here's the Hudson River. You know, the earth is healing. We are the virus, we're all stuck inside. And so all nature is coming back. Um, so they took that further and made it into a parody and satire of that incident. Now this one's obvious. You can see that this is not true, um, but it illustrates that that satire and parody and what it, what it is. Now there is a dark side to satire and parody. Sometimes um, there's a post 
that uh, someone will make, for example, this post um, was made and it says that Trump parted Charles Manson and gives a little news article about why he pardoned him and, and all of this. Um, it was made as satire, as parody, someone who wrote it, um, their website is actually clearly labeled as satire, but someone just saw the headline and took it as truth and then started sharing it. Now, this Marianne Williamson is actually a government um, elected official. I, I forget what, what state she was in, but she actually saw this and posted on her Twitter saying there's something deeply sinister about Trump pardoning Charles Manson, even posthumous, I can never pronounce this word, <laughs> posthumously, <laughs> um, dog whistles of the very worst possible kind. So we want to trust our elected officials, right? So when we see them post a headline like this, we're apt to believe it. So this is sort of the dark side of parody is someone makes parody to be a joke, Someone sees it and looks at it without a critical eye, believing it to be true, and then shares it as the truth. And then the further and further and further it gets from the satirical website, the less people know that it began as a joke and it becomes this sort of truth, you know, as it moves further away from the original source. So satire is great and it has a great purpose in our society to, you know, critique you know, things that are going on, but we have to be very careful with it because it can become dangerous. So the next type is false context. And this is when we use something that's real, but write a false story around it. Now, here's a picture, come up in a second, um, of two ballots from the election. It is a real picture. Nothing is photoshopped about this picture. These are photos of um, ballots. But the story that has been wrapped around it says these are two ballots for the same person. So this is a ballot and a second ballot, but it, for the same person. So thinking that this person can now vote twice in the national election. What? context is missing from this is that these were dummy ballots to practice fitting into the envelopes and mailing. You know, when you're mailing hundreds of thousands of ballots, you need to make sure they fit in the envelope. You need to make sure that they don't weigh too much. You know, you need to make sure it all works. So they've made a dummy, you know, to make sure it all works and goes together. So real picture, but someone took this it out of its story and then put a new story around it making it look real. So a lot of times we'll see on social media, a headline with a picture. And in our brains, we've been taught that, you know, pictures are evidence, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, you know, we see to believe, but that's not always the case. Yes, you see a ballot with one person's name on both ballots, but there is a deeper story that exists. And we always have to question in our mind, you know, why might this, these ballots exist other than the reason they're posting online? We always have to be questioning that. So I have another example of this child um, in a cage. And the headline is, this is what happens when government believes people are illegal, kids in cages. Now we see this and you have an emotional reaction. You see this child hanging onto the bars, he, his face, he obviously does not look happy um, and you have an emotional reaction. And that's what the people who posted this are hoping for. When you are emotional, you are not thinking clearly with all of your critical brain. You are letting your emotions decide things for you. So this story, is yes, a kid, yes, in a cage, yes, near an immigration facility, but it was actually a protest outside 
of the immigration facility where a parent took their kid and put them in a cage to demonstrate what it was like inside the facility or might be like in the facility. So yes, the conditions in some of the immigration facilities are probably are, you know, not the best conditions, especially for our children. But this picture, this particular picture is not evidence of that. So we just have to realize that we can't just go sharing this stuff. Yes, your feelings about immigration and how children are handled in that process are valid, but you can't share this as evidence because it's not. You need to go and find something that's real and something that um, is actual evidence rather than sharing that misinformation. Okay, so imposter content can be tricky because just as the name um, implies, it's when someone's pretending to be someone that they're not. So this was kind of a, a funny one that came up um, early on in the pandemic where um, someone named Sharon posted, I will not shop at Costco until you remove your mandatory mask rule. And then there is a post below that that says Costco, and it looks like it's from Costco Wholesale. And they say, thank you for sharing such a brave, taking such a brave stand. We look forward to the documentary they will make about you someday. So that's a little snarky, a little, you know, a little zinger back to this person. Um, and some people looking at this might be like, oh boy, you know, Costco's being a little sassy there. Um, but it is imposter content. If you actually go and Google Costco's, I believe this was Instagram, um, or no, I'm sorry, it's Facebook. Um, if someone actually went to Costco's Facebook page, and looked up the history, they wouldn't see that they actually didn't post this. So it's just someone pretending to be someone they're not. You really have to be careful in this case. Another example here is someone um, pretended to be Taylor Swift and said, um, some of you seem all right. Don't go to Nashville on Christmas. And if you remember the news, um, there was a bombing, um, a car bomb in Nashville on Christmas Eve. I, I think it was Christmas Eve. And so people see this and they're like, Taylor Swift knew about this. Well, you know, there's some controversy here. She knew about the bomb before it was gonna go off. Again, creating that distrust and that, that chaos. So I'm gonna show you some tricks um, on identifying imposter content. Um, you know, as I'm showing you these examples, it seems like doom and gloom and, you know, I can't trust anything anymore. But as we get into the second part of the presentation, I'm going to start showing you some ways that will make you feel more confident in, in surfing the internet and finding these things. So don't get scared <laughs> quite yet. Um, so the next is fabricated and manipulated content. And that is when we take something and change it a little bit. This is from a video that was on YouTube um, where it has a guy with a hard hat and an orange vest. He's like, I'm a 5G installer. and you have to look at what's in the stuff I'm installing. They told me not to open the box, but I, I opened it and look what's inside. And on top of the microchip or the, you know, tower electronics is a tiny little um, container with a brown liquid and what looks like a little squirting device. And it's labeled COV-19. Oh, oh, 5G towers are squirting COVID-19 into the air. That's how we all get COVID. Um, that's what they're trying to tell you. Now, what has happened is someone actually who knows microchips and, and can identify what types they are actually take a look at this and identified this chipboard as like the back of a, a TV monitor. You know, if you ripped it open and took out the thing in the back. And then obviously they took some sort of container and glued it on with some brown liquid in it and then made this nice YouTube video. So we can take things that are partially real and try to make them look um, real and mean something else. Um, you can also have fun with manipulated content, you know, here with the, the Queen of England, you know, she's wearing a green sweater. You can easily switch out that green sweater, make her wear a cat sweater. Um, you know, she never wore that cat sweater, but you can make it look like she did um, using some Photoshop magic.
Okay, so again, I'll stop for a second in case you guys, I know I'm throwing a lot out you at once, um, but as we get into the practicing part, we'll apply some of this later on. Okay, so eight here on the misinformation landscape, and this is gonna talk about how some of this misinformation is made. So I showed you that post of Taylor Swift, um, and I'm gonna show you how, how someone would make a post like that, how it, someone would make imposter content. So this is a post um, from NASA, or supposedly NASA, and it says, I'm looking for a new hobby while in lockdown. Get one of NASA's own blue light lasers to draw on the moon. And it's kind of tiny, but right on the moon, you can see a tiny little blue heart that's on the moon there. Official NASA Twitter. They must be really selling this, right? What it really is from is this website called um, Zeoob. Z e o o b dot com, and basically you you rip a picture of NASA from the internet, upload it. Um, the picture of the moon is a picture that I took from my telescope, um, and then you just say what you want the post to look like, how many likes you want it to have, you know, how many thumbs up, how many thumbs down, the date stamp, how, you know, what the time stamp of when it was posted, and then it just auto generates this post so you can grab a screenshot of it and make it look real and it literally takes 30 seconds if you have the photos ready it's so easy so when you're scrolling through facebook or instagram and you see a screenshot of another social media post understand it will take 20 30 seconds for someone to fake that you don't need photoshop skills you don't need any fancy equipment. It is simply 30 seconds of drag and drop and type. So whenever you see a social media post, you really want, want to, especially a screenshot of a social media post, you want to go back to the original one and see if it was really posted. Now, some people will claim, oh, it was deleted and that's why you can't find the original. Someone saying it's being deleted is a red flag that they're trying to trick you. Yes, it's possible that it was deleted. That happens. People say stupid things and then delete them. Yes. But if they're like always on you about, oh, well, this was deleted, this was deleted, it's something to look into more. It's a red flag. Not necessarily a completely a lie, but a red flag for you to look into further. Um, the next thing that is against us here is um, bots. Now, this statistic that I got, oh, it's so tiny, I can't read it, what year it was. I think it was 2018. Um, Facebook removed 3 billion fake accounts that weren't just fake by, you know, someone making up their, you know, duplicate account somewhere. They were 3 billion accounts created by artificial intelligence. So, Computers are great. They give us so much power in the world, but they also can be used to, you know, gain money by tricking us, by gaining advantage, by, you know, tricking groups of people. So if you see things being posted online by someone you don't know, be aware there is a possibility that is not a real person. People have trained computers to interact with you and seem like a person. Um, if you do any sort of chatting with customer support online, there's a good chance that the, at least the beginning part of that conversation was artificial intelligence. It's really hard to tell the difference. You know, there are some that are better than others, but they have been trained so well that they can have a back and forth conversation with you to a certain extent. So you know, knowing who your friends are online and actually knowing that they are real people in real life is important. So there's also content farms. Um, these aren't quite harmful, but they can be harmful for people who 
you know, ha don't have fully developed brains yet, teenagers, young kids. Um, there's five minute crafts, 15 minute crafts. Um, I forget what some of the other names of the websites are, but there are these quick little five, 10 second how to videos that just cycle through different things. Um, and I, I can't play this one right now, but I can give you an example of it. You can see there's a woman putting some hot glue on a toothbrush. And essentially all the video shows is the woman putting the hot glue on the toothbrush and immediately putting it in her mouth and then scrubbing her teeth. And you can imagine if that gets on her gums, that's gonna severely burn her gums. There's no explanation about what it's for, why you would do that, um, but it's a very happy looking woman with nice white teeth. So maybe they think it's some sort of hack to get white teeth. Some other examples include, um, they showed mixing water and bleach and some strawberries to get white strawberries. And then, yeah, they're white, but would you eat them? But it doesn't give you that context. It just shows you how to get white strawberries. And for children, that can be very dangerous. Um, they had another one where they, you know, melted some like Werther's originals in a pan and then put it on um, a mixer to try to make like a cool, like, you know, sugar sculpture. But of course that's hot caramel and that, you know, can fling onto your skin and your eyes. So these are some things to keep in mind is that the, the purpose of these are to get money. People watch them. They, they get money through the ads and stuff like that. So those are out there. They're obnoxious, they're weird, um, but it's something to realize um, that's out there, especially if you have young people in your uh, life who might not understand that these are ridiculous and dangerous sometimes. Um, I mentioned trolls earlier. Um, trolls like when you get mad, so don't feed them. Just leave them alone. If someone's making you mad online and they're not a personal friend of yours, just leave them alone. Just don't engage with them because they literally like when you get mad. And if you see those memes of someone sitting there popping popcorn, you know, like they're watching a show, that's what they're doing. They're just enjoying watching you um, get angry. So don't feed the trolls. No, I, I put it there. I forgot it. I put it in there. So don't don't, don't be a show for people and, and getting with arguments online. Um, just let them deal with someone else. So um, I forgot about this one. So let me switch really quick um, so I can show you um, my screen here so I can show you those videos. So as I'm loading this up, um, deep fakes are a new technology that just, I don't know how long ago, oh, let me load this for a minute. Okay, so um, sorry, I'm just picking this so we can share it. Okay. So I, no longer can see you guys, but I'm going to um, just come out of this for a minute so I can just see you guys. Okay, so I'm just gonna open my chat really quick. So if, if you guys can't see this or whatever, just throw it in the chat because I can't see you anymore. Okay, so I have my chat open so I can see that. So. Deep fakes are basically, again, artificial intelligence taking one video and mapping someone else's video on top of it. So I have this one here of, um, oh boy, I forgot his name. Jack Nicholson, right? <laughs> Jack Nicholson in um, the horror movie, My Mind is Drawing a Blank. Um, and then we have uh, Jim Carrey doing the same thing. So we play those side by side for just a minute. It's very subtle movement. Um, Uh, 
Okay, so let me just share again. The other device. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I have, I have you set up on my phone here, so I just have to get back to the presentation. Um, okay, so that is a deep fake. And basically, Jim Carrey never wore those clothes. Jim Carrey never acted in that movie. Simply a computer generated that image. And so now not only are photos not believable, but videos to a certain extent can't be 100% believable either because we can easily map someone else's face onto someone else's voice, onto someone else's place, and you can see them saying and doing things that they never actually did. Um, there are a lot of universities who are doing really good research to try to make sure that we have ways to identify these deep fakes and make sure that, you know, they're not completely destroying our society because now we can't trust anything. Um, so there are smart people working on this, um, but it's something that's just starting now. So it's not quite under, you know, we don't quite know how to identify them easily. Luckily, very few people have computers that make such high quality ones that um, are, are believable to our eyes. A lot of them, you can see they look a little fake. They look a little weird around the edges and things. Um, so if we're looking closely, you, you usually can tell nowadays, but who knows what will happen in the next couple of years. Um, I'm gonna skip that one for now. Okay, so now we're actually gonna talk about the fact checking stuff. Um, but before I do that, let me open up my chat again. I threw a lot at you in the last 45 minutes. So give you guys a couple seconds to digest that and ask any questions. Okay, so fact checking after all, everything I just shared with you might seem a little overwhelming. You can't trust pictures, you can't trust video, you can't trust this, you can't trust that. Um, so my advice to you is to pick the hill you die on. You know, what things are really important to you? You know, what things do you want to make sure that your understanding are right? I mean, ultimately, yes, we want to trust everything, but it's not the world that we live in with the internet. Um, so we have to sort of pick what's important to us and, you know, pick what we share and to, to fact check that before we share it out. So really take an inventory of what's important to you and go ahead and fact check those things and make sure that they are something that you're willing to spend time on. Um, because you're going to find that, you know, the more effort you put into fact checking, the more you can trust it. Maybe you would do like a one minute fact check. And you're like, okay, yeah, I believe that. That's okay. But to someone else, they might need to do like a 10, 20 minute deep dive and really figure this out. And that's okay too. Everybody has different things that are important to them. So as I go through this, you know, I'll, I'll talk you through some of the mindset that I had and what was, you know, what was my hill to die on and what was worthy of more looking into it um, and what was just like, okay, I believe it. Okay, so the first thing we have is lateral reading. This is the first fact checking tool. And this is the tool that actual fact checkers from journalists and you know big organizations use they do lateral reading lateral reading is just a fancy way of saying opening up a new tab and googling something it's as simple as that and it's cr a critical step you'll be amazed how many people just don't do a quick google check 
because usually a quick Google check will show you that it is a scam, show you that it is fake, or show you that it is not trustworthy. Just a one quick Google. Now, sometimes there's misinformation that you'll find on Google. So these nine organizations have done the work for you. And these were shared with me by um, a gentleman from the News Literacy Project, and they're all trustworthy, um, in, in my opinion. Now, I gave you all nine because maybe there are some funders of these nonprofits that you disagree with, and maybe you want to find another organization that more aligns with, you know, with your viewpoints. Now, these are all back checking sites. So they really are all on the same page, but sometimes people get a little touchy about who's funding an organization and who's not. And that's actually a good thing to do is to know who is funding it. Um, but I want to give people a variety of options, you know, to find an organization that they feel like they can trust. I can say that I trust all of these. I've, I've looked up into um, the, their research and they show the steps on how they did the research and they reference back to articles. So they, they do a good job. As a librarian, I've analyzed that and um, it's, it's trustworthy in my, in my opinion, but not everyone shares the same um, trustworthiness scale. So that's why I give you all these options. The most well-known is Snopes um, and probably the least well-known is Africa Check, but I actually, Africa Check is actually quite amazing um, when I check that one out. So. If you want to check out some of these other ones, um, go ahead and do that. And I have a handout that I can give Peggy that has these on it. If you don't want to furiously write these down, I have them listed. Okay, so this is an example of some lateral reading. Um, this is a post from Facebook. And it says, a friend who's fully into the COVID conspiracy sent me this post that says, Captain America predicted the coronavirus outbreak in 2011. And while it obviously is BS, I started fixating on that circle, circled image on the right. So this is an example of, of the process you would go through if you saw this post and wanted to fact check it. So here's a little closer image of that circled image. Kind of looks like a coronavirus, right? It's from 2011, Captain America. I mean, that's well before, you know, that's like, 10 years before it happened, maybe they knew it was coming. So we'll look into it. So this person um, went a little bit beyond um, just opening a new tab and searching, but I think it shows a good process of the mindset of what he followed to do this research. So first um, he thought of a YA novel um, that had a similar cover, which was Divergent. So he was like, oh, well, let me look up that See if it was just an advertisement for this book. It was close, but it wasn't quite there. So he got a friend to help him look. Got a screenshot, you know, got a better picture of it. So this is where he gets into opening a new tab as it pops up here. So first he figured the filming date. He'd find out actually when did they film this in Times Square? because you know, ads change all the time in New York City. So they found it um, on Wikipedia. They found out that they were filming um, on April 22nd, 2011. And so they looked up all the Broadway shows that were happening at that time to see maybe if it was an ad for a Broadway show. Nothing looked familiar there. So then they went to YouTube videos from that time to see if they could get like a better view of it. And then his friend did find one. If you can see sort of in the left-hand corner, there is a like a more clear picture of it. And he zoomed in. And it was spaghetti. So I use this example because um, the, the conclusion is, is on on spot the, the the conclusion is it's spaghetti will be my only response to conspiracy theorists from now on um i just love that um so anytime any conspiracy comes at you you're like nope it's just spaghetti so that's an example of 
a quite drawn out um, lateral reading, um, but basically just Googling things and trying to get down to the answer. Okay, so I'm gonna show some more examples of that lateral reading again later on, um, but I wanna talk a little bit about media bias. And so we know that there is bias in some news. You know, some news is good about being centered and some news is not so good about being centered. Um, and so there is a chart online that you may have seen um, called the news bias chart. And it basically lists all the news organizations, you know, the ones that are right leaning over here, the ones that are left leaning over here, the ones that are trustworthy up top, the ones that are not so trustworthy down at the bottom. So kind of this continuum of where they land. And now it's a great tool, but it is just one tool. I wouldn't use this chart as an end all be all because newsrooms change staff and different reporters in different organizations have different um, professionalism about being unbiased. So it's always changing, but it's a good gut check for you when you're reading um, an article from a news organization that you don't quite know yet. So this is what the chart looks like. Um, you can see up at the top where it's very, really trustworthy, you have the AP. Down at the bottom, um, you have the National Enquirer. And then you have both left and right leaning things. Now, I took the screenshot a couple of years ago, so things have shifted around a little bit, as I said. But if you see a news article from an organization that you're not familiar with, Maybe check it out, see where it falls on this chart and see if it's trustworthy. Okay, so um, the next thing I wanna do is talk about critical observation. And I'm gonna have you read this post and I can read it out loud, but I want you to see what, what's going on here and think in your mind, the purpose of this is critical observation, like use your brain, what is weird here? All I've ever wanted from a yogurt is to know who the cows are. And then it lists some cows' names in this yogurt container. Um, Meryl, Lenny, in, Letty. So tiny, I can't read it. But there's a bunch of girls' names. And then it says, someone posted, yeah, notice how they named all the cows traditionally girl names. There is a deep connection between, between misogyny and consuming animals. So it's someone making the point that people who are not vegan are misogynistic. And you might have feelings about veganism or not, but look at this closely with a critical eye. I want to see if anyone can get what is wrong here. Bonus points, anyone who gets it. It took me a while. It took me an embarrassing long time to figure this out. <laughs> um, basically, I feel like yogurt from a bull wouldn't taste quite right. <laughs> So of course they're all girl names because you can't get milk from boy cows. So it's, you know, and I don't know if this person posted it as a joke or not, but you know, you read that quickly and you have strong feelings about feminism and veganism. You know, you might get right on board or you might get angry about it. Um, it's just, we need to have a critical mind when we're looking at things online. We need to open up our brains and turn them on and not just get caught up in the drama of things. Okay, so we have about a half an hour left. I think we're good on track. So um, if you wanna practice those critical observation skills, there is this great website called um, First Draft and they have the Observation Online Challenge. And it's basically a tool where you can practice critically observing things to figure out um, key details in figuring out where things take place and if they're trustworthy or not.
Okay, so the next one is one of my favorite ones. And it is the web archives tool. It's, um, it's from the Internet Archive, and it's called the Wayback Machine. And basically, any website that has ever existed is archived on this website. Of course, they don't have all of them, but they have pretty much all of them. I, I haven't found any that I can't find yet in using this tool. And so I'll show you how this works. So what I did was I found this post on Reddit and it was some more internet drama and it kind of drew me in. And it says, today would have been the day where we would have filmed Justin and Alexis's wedding in Colorado Springs. After what Justin pulled in the media to try and shake us down for a refund, we hope you sob and cry all day for what would have been your wedding day. Sorry, not sorry. So I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, there's some drama there. So I wanted to look into it um, and find out what was going on. You know, is this company in the right about being sassy or is this guy, you know, in the right? Is he, should he have got a refund? So the deeper story was that um, this guy's fiance died before the wedding. And he asked the videographer for a refund. Um, and they're like, no. And they posted this as a response of him asking for that refund. So I was like, okay, well, you know, it was drama. And when you get emotions, you know to double check things. So I did. So first thing I did was ask some questions. Is Copper Stallion Media even a real company? Or did someone just make up this whole story? Because that does happen on the internet. Um, and then if so, you know, what, what's the truth? So I did lateral reading first. You talked about that before. So I just Googled Copper Stallion Media and their Yelp page came up and it did, it came up. So, okay, good. I made up, um, I could see they had one star, so maybe they're not that great. Um, so I was like, okay, well, what did their website say? Did they say anything about this drama on the website? So I went to the website and it wasn't up anymore. It was taken down. That's where the web archive comes in. The web archive kept track of the website, even though it was deleted. So basically you go to the web archive website and you search the URL. So in this case, I put in www.copperstallionmedia dot com and searched and basically what happens is a calendar comes up with different years and different months and you can see when they got a snapshot of the website and i saw that they had a snapshot of the website from the year before so i was like okay so i clicked on it and there the website came back up that was deleted so i could have access to their deleted website so this is what their website said. It said on May 20th, 2020, our company was subject to an online smear campaign for not refunding a client who died in a car accident. The client signed a non-refundable contract. As a result, friends, family, and strangers have emailed, called, and left reviews of our company on social media. Online bullying is real. We are in contact with local authorities to see what can be done in terms of criminal charges. We are also reaching out to legal counsel to see what legal action we can take to obtain a judgment for damages. Okay, there was some drama here. So I know the story wasn't completely made up. I continued to look and I found out that a little bit later, they actually updated their business website to show a picture of the fiance. Um, and they posted the email that the fiance sent to them asking for the refund. And it actually seemed pretty reasonable to me. It said, you know, I'd like to push my reservation maybe 10 years from now in case I get married again. You know, if you're not going to give me a refund, maybe if I do get married again, I could use you guys and, and use that as a credit. Um, you know, and he's just trying to get his money back. Um, and so I was like, okay. This shows his side of the story. It shows the other people's side of the story. 
there obviously was some drama there. But I drew the line there. I didn't want to get drawn into this anymore. This was my not my hill to die on. I was like, okay, this was a real internet drama. I even found some news clips about it or it was covered by the news. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to waste any more of my time looking. So that's when you have to know, like, is this important enough to me to keep on going or am I good? And I was good. So the next one is a pretty easy um, tool. I, I kind of started with some of the harder ones, but the next one's pretty easy and that's the reverse image search. And that's when you find a picture online and you want to see whether it's true. Um, you know, whether it's being used to tell the true story. Remember we talked about false context where you take a real picture, but wrap a fake story around it. This is the tool that can help you figure those out. So I was on Reddit, another social media website. And they, I found this post and it basically says, this is the only woman who's been hit by a meteor. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, I mean, poor lady, it looks like this nasty bruise that she got. Um, but I do know that sometimes historical photos can be taken out of context and, you know, told false stories. So I, I did a reverse image search and I'll show you how to do that. Basically, Google is the easiest way. And you just go to, um, actually, I don't, I don't have the URL. So let me look that up really quick. So I'm not giving you incorrect information myself. Google. Okay, so you just look up Google image search and then you get, I have that screenshot right there. It looks exactly like that. Um, and basically all that you have to do is click on the little, um, camera, sorry, I'm a loss of words there. Uh, click on the little camera where the little icon is and you either copy and paste a picture in or you put the URL to where the website posted the picture in and it will do a search online and show you. Um, alternatively, you can right click on the image and this will come up and basically it will say, um, search Google for image. It's the third one from the bottom, search Google for image. And then what you get is a result that looks like this. It will search for that image. It will try to match all the pixels and find out where else it's posted online. And luckily this was a really easy, easy find. The first, article is from National Geographic. Whoops, sorry, I thought I had one more, one more slide there about it. Um, the first result there was from National Geographic and I trust National Geographic. I pulled up the article. There was the picture of the woman with the information about how she got struck by a meteor in 1950 something. Um, so check, done. It took me about 40 seconds to fact check that. And now I know that that is a true story. So the next tool is geolocation. And this can be an easy one or a hard one to do. Um, and I'll give you an example of how I did that to sort of demonstrate how it works. So again, another social media post that I wanted to fact check. It said Muslims receive permission to gather for social distancing prayers at an Ikea parking lot in Germany. It's like, well, that's a nice story, um, but easily made up. Yeah, there's a picture, but that could be a picture of any event outside in a parking lot. I don't know for sure if those are people actually praying or doing yoga, I have no idea. So I wanted to fact check it. So what I did was I started again with some questions. Is the post real? Um, I, I look, the name of the person who posted it. And I actually go to their Instagram and see if they actually posted this picture. You know, where in Germany was it taken? Is there actually an Ikea in that location? Um, and then can I match this location with actual geolocation? 
So first, we're going to attack is the post real. So here is the post and I think it was Twitter, actually. Yeah. So I found the guy. I googled his name in Twitter and his account came up and his original post with the picture was there. Great. So it's a real post. It was not made by one of those social media generators. I know that. Still could be fake. He still could have faked this, but at least I know now that it's not totally faked by using a generator. So I was took it a step further. Found a map of Germany and I Googled IKEAs. I said, how many IKEAs are in Germany? And there were three. There were three. I'm like, oh, that's pretty easy. You know, I can I can check out three IKEAs. That's not overwhelming. So I got the street view of the first IKEA. I just picked one randomly and I was like, okay, let's zoom into it and see if I can match the parking lot. So here it is. I zoomed in, got the parking lot, and then I pulled up the picture that was with the post. And I tried to compare. And then this is where those critical thinking skills come in and critical observation skills, you know, trying to match it, match pieces. So I'm going to have you guys take a look. Um, and again, I welcome you guys to, you know, put what you find in the chat or shout it out. Um, but take a look at these two pictures and can you see places where it either looks the same or looks different? I know there are two different angles, one's looking down and one is looking across. Um, but if you use those critical observation skills, I think you can find a couple of places here that will give you some clues. And if you guys just want to do this quietly yourselves too, I'll let you guys think for a couple seconds. So the first thing that I noticed when I was doing this was the looked like boxes. Um, grab my mouse here so you can see. Um, I saw this little looks like a box here. I'm guessing is a cart corral. They kind of run in between the parking spaces, and I could see them also here. I mean, all parking lots usually have parking corrals. But they kind of are similar in color. They're grayish. They're about the same shape. I also noticed that, that the parking lot has alternating colors. There's a light strip, a dark strip, and a light strip, and then a grass strip, and then a pattern. So I do see from the above aerial view, there is that, you know, dark strip, light strip a tiny strip in the middle, which might be grass, I'm not sure, um, but it does have the alternating pattern, which is, at least in the United States, is not a typical parking lot pattern. Um, I don't know, I haven't parked in Germany before, so I don't know if that's typical of Germany. But what I also noticed is this curve right here. So there's a tiny chunk of a road in the original photo to the right hand side. And then here also is a tiny chunk of, is, well, here you can see the whole thing. There's a curve. And next to that curve is one, two, three signs. You can see their shadow and you can see a little bit of the white. And then also in here, there is one, two, three little white signs here. So you can see that it looks like this is the same location. You know, you can see the blue of the Ikea in the background. You can see the blue a little bit here, a little bit of yellow here. I'm convinced that it's the same parking lot. Doesn't mean there are not people doing yoga there instead, but at least this is in Germany. He wasn't lying there. And it looks like it's the same Ikea. 
and that leads us to a step closer to believing it. Now, I can't remember if I had one more. No, nope. okay, I didn't have another piece there, but what I ended up doing was, was Googling it one more time, and I found a news article that covered it from a website that I trusted, which I think was CNN. Um, so I, with that, <clears throat> I was able to be like, okay, that happened. What a, what a sweet story. You know, that was nice of them to open up their parking lot for those people to pray. Um, when they weren't supposed to be gathering inside. So about 15 minutes left. And I wanna talk, I want help you guys, hopefully, if I haven't completely overwhelmed you, um, have some tools about figuring out how to tell truth from fiction online. Um, but now I wanna talk a little bit about you helping other people because that's, that's an important piece of this too. So you've done the first step, which is educating yourself. Um, next is you guys have to sort of practice. You have to find some of these posts and practice fact checking them and finding out if they're trustworthy or not to you. Um, use Checkology. Um, it's everything that I've learned has been from there in the News Literacy Project. They're a really great nonprofit um, and I highly suggest checking out their resources. Um, so I um wanted to go over one more piece of <clears throat> um handout for you and the sort of the final things about helping other people um but i i do want to mention two other things is that you know we are, are emotion animals you know we run on emotion and emotion is a wonderful thing. It makes us human, but it also is our weakness. So whenever you come across a social media post that makes you mad, or even makes you say, oh, you know, it's something cute, that emotion um, can be used against you. So always check the fear, the anger, you know, the cuteness, just, just double check things before you do any action, before sharing it, um, and before, um, you know, taking any other action, you know, that's, that's an important thing to do. So, um, I'm going to pull up this handout again on my other screen. So let me share screen on my other device. Okay. Let me just pull up my chat here so I can see you guys. If you have anything to and okay great so i have the chat open um so this is a handout um which i think you guys can see type it in there if you can't see it i think i pulled up the right screen um again i'm saying how great checkology is this is a resource from checkology um, but they give you a nice guide on how to speak up about misinformation without starting a fight and just, you know, losing a friendship or, you know, making someone angry. Um, some tips to keep in mind, because we really want to try to help people, you know, when they are sharing misinformation, realize that that's what they're doing, but we need to do it in a way that's not going to make people angry. No one likes to be wrong. Um, and, and we need to, you know, have a way of dealing with that. So the number one thing is, is just to be nice, you know, especially if it's someone who's maybe just an acquaintance or someone we don't even know online, it's, it's really easy to be like, okay, dummy, you know, that's not true. Um, you know, we really need to be civil and, and realize that they might be sharing this thing, you know, truly thinking that it's true and, um, and, and realize that they're not necessarily doing it to be unkind. Um, it, and take your time. You know, you want to have done the fact checking before you sort of call someone on um, posting something that's incorrect and being able to come to them with facts. Um, and usually you'll find that there is some common ground. Um, it seems impossible sometimes with some of the things that we argue about in this world. Um, but really, we have common ground with people. And so just try to find that common ground and, and stick to it. And the next one is um, 
laying out the facts. You know, you have to be careful with this one because there's actually some research that shows that the more facts, if someone believes something that's not true, say, you know, they're flat earthers, people who believe the earth is flat, um, the more scientific research you come at them with, the harder they'll believe their original theory that the earth is flat. There's some research that shows it's just unfortunately how our brains work is that you know the more evidence you throw at someone, the more they're gonna buckle down and be like, no, I don't believe it. So you, you, you do have to be careful with how you share what you find um, because it, it's a really hard thing to balance. There's no, there's no quick, quick and easy fix. Um, and then the last one is about being patient and persistent. Don't forget that second P, patient and persistent. Um, you know, don't give up. It, it might seem like a hard situation and something you just don't want to deal with, but, you know, it's for everybody's good is if we can have information out there that's trustworthy and, and believable. So, um, you know, don't give up, you know, you can take a break, of course, <laughs> and, and come back later, but, but, you know, keep, keep trying to do it and keep trying to do what you guys are doing. Um, you, you took the first step by coming here tonight and, um, listening to me talk all night, um, but you guys uh, definitely, you know, can take these and, and walk away and, and hopefully make your, your online social media a little bit more fact, fact checking there. Um, so let me um, close this and we have about 10 minutes left and I still wanna give you guys some time to um, ask some questions if you have it. I just have to, uh, close my share so I can see you guys again. But for some reason I can't. <clears throat> but shout out any questions you guys have in these last last 10 minutes. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Miranda, uh, did you have a um you have a a handout that you would um, email us to and you'll can email me? Okay. Yeah. Yep, and then I can um, send that to all the people when uh, and with the recording. That'll probably be a couple weeks by the time the recording, but I can send your handout. No, this was really wonderful. I learned so much. I'm trying to uh, take all these notes again. I know. I said, I'd see if I can uh, find it. I said, especially after the election and all, we had so much. It seemed like fake media <laughs> that it's really, I don't know, but it's, um, yeah, fascinating. A fascinating yeah. study. Does that, I don't know if any, yeah. It's just like any skill, like you just have to practice it. And, and I'm still not really great at it, but you know, I, I just try to practice it every time I have a few extra minutes. Well, it's important because it really, um, with all the information that's thrown at us, we really need to be more careful. And, and as you said, um, investigate. And you know, that's, I've really learned some wonderful tips. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? I don't think I see anything in the chat here. I guess we were kind of a quiet bunch, but we learned a lot. <laughs> and then if, yeah, I said, we'll have to have you back again for a follow-up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I have this right after the election, but a lot has happened since then. So. Right, no, that's great. That is great. And then you are planning to do it at some other libraries you mentioned, like Pittsburgh, you'll be doing it there. And yeah, so. Well, thank you so much. That really, we, we learned so much. Does anybody have any final thoughts, questions, comments, I mean, we will be sending out. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. lots of info. Right, we'll be sending out the information folks and then probably the, um, uh, it looks like by the time the uh, recording is um, actually available, it might be a couple weeks, so it won't be right away, but we'll send that uh, out to you, Miranda and then to all of the uh, participants and there was a person who did a couple of people that missed it tonight too so they'll get it as well okay perfect. So, so thank you everyone i don't think if there's any more questions i guess we can conclude and thank you again miranda enjoy the rest of the summer before school starts <laughs> do <Thanks>. yeah <laughs> i know thank you everyone have a good evening take care Thanks. bye, -bye.